The importance perhaps has only been recognized uh, over the last 12 years. Uh, this caused some consternation to me and some of my colleagues uh, when we came to uh, Trinity, and particularly coming from a French tradition uh, where World War II and the Holocaust uh, have been given such an importance. It was always a mystery uh, to me as to why uh, it hadn't been uh, recognized uh, so uh, uh, in such an important way uh, in Ireland. And that was testimony of my ignorance uh, of Irish politics and Irish history. I won't talk too much about that because times have moved on, thank goodness. But an occasion such as this, when we're going to be speaking about Mary Elms, a former student uh, of this college who studied French and Spanish and was indeed a gold medalist, so testimony to her academic excellence. Um, this is a time which raises questions about remembrance. Remembrance about World War II, certainly, about the Irish role uh, in uh, World War II. Uh, and I mention this because of the context uh, in which some of my colleagues and I have been working. We've been campaigning to have a memorial for the 111 Trinity War Dead and I see now that we need to campaign also for Mary Elms to have a plaque, I think. Her story, of course, will unfold in the course of this evening. But perhaps, I'll just perhaps leave it there. Um, uh, we wrote the story of the Trinity Warded uh, in this book, Southern Ireland and the Liberation of France. Uh, I'd just like to, before I hand over to uh, Lynn, just recall... Uh, the words of Paul Ricoeur, who tells us what the duty of memory is. Le devoir de mémoire est le devoir de rendre justice par le souvenir à notre que soit. So the duty of remembrance is the duty to render justice through memory to somebody other than oneself. And this is, in our small way, what we're doing this evening, uh, thanks to Cloda. Uh, Finn's book. This is what we're doing uh, to one of our most important, I think, Trinity graduates. Um, I'll hand over to Lynn Jackson of the Holocaust Education Trust to say a few words uh, of introduction, but thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Excellencies, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Holocaust Education Trust Ireland, it is once again a great pleasure to be working here in Trinity College for this annual lecture, our November lecture, which uh, we have been organising for several years now. And uh, we're delighted to be working this time, not only with the Herzog Centre, but with the Department of French and Professor Al Sarah Allen Stacey, and to have our distinguished guest, Claude Finn, with us as well this evening. Um, I actually thought tonight was my, to be my night off and did not expect to be standing here on the podium, but um, I'm not going to outline our work because I think you know that we really are committed to Holocaust um, education and remembrance, and we are the only organisation in Ireland uh, doing that, so if you want to look us up on your computers, it is Holocaust Education Trust Ireland our Holocaust education, anything else in Ireland, you'll get us. And that reminds me, just to remind all of you, that the National Holocaust Memorial Day commemoration will take place at the end of January, and we would love to welcome all of you to it. It is free, but you do need an invitation. And in order to get an invitation, you need to contact the office, and we will put your names on the guest list and send you out your invitations in the beginning of January. I think we are all very intrigued to hear the work that Cloda has completed in creating this book about Mary Elm, so worthy of recognition, and the righteous among the nations, non-Jewish people who risked their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust, are really the heroes of our generation, and it is exciting to, uh, to have you here, Cloda, and to hear the story of uh, Mary Elms, and I will 
that you uh, share that with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Um, welcome to everybody. And the first thing I want to say is a very big thank you to the Holocaust Education Trust Ireland, to the Herzog Centre, to the School of Languages and to the French Department and Professor Sarah Allen Stacey. Thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. Um, it gives me great pleasure actually to see Mary Elms there, um, writ large if you like. Um, for too long she, she, she's not a name. Had anybody heard of her in the last, before, before the recent publicity? Yes, of course you had. Yeah, I don't, there is Manus. Um, she came to my attention. Just to give you, I'm going to briefly outline how I came to Mary Elms and what I uncovered in writing the book. Um, it's a fascinating story, and there's the story of the Holocaust, and she saved hundreds of people, and we're, we're here to commemorate that tonight. But also, I think you, you'll see that she did so much during the Spanish Civil War, and she saved hundreds of children by feeding and sheltering them during the Spanish Civil War as well. And I also want to pay tribute to her time here in Trinity, because she was a gold medalist and a scholar, and she was a first-class graduate, first-class honours graduate from the very beginning. Um, I suppose it's fitting that I first heard about Mary Elms here in Trinity College. Smashing Times Theatre Company had put on a beautiful vignette about the forgotten women of war. And she was one of them. And as Lynn has said, I heard she was a righteous among the nations. And I suppose most of you here would have heard of Oscar Schindler, who's also a righteous among the nations. And it's an honor given by Israel to non-Jews who saved Jewish people um, during the Holocaust. And she is the only Irish person to have this honor. And I asked myself, why isn't she a household name? So that's where it began for me. And I suppose what really astounded me was I wasn't actually expecting to discover and to meet the people that she saved. So I'm going to start there with her lasting legacy. Um, this is Michael Frond from Canada. Um, Mary Elms drove him out of an internment camp in Reef Salt in the southwest of France in 1942, saving his life. This is Charlotte Berger Grenache. Um, that she was in that same camp. The authorities were waiting until she turned five so that they could deport her with her mother. Um, Mary's colleagues in the Red Cross got her out of the camp and Mary Elms arranged a place for her in a children's home so she kept her safe. Sorry, beg your pardon. This is Georges Coltin. He and his brother were also taken out of that camp by Mary Elms and brought to a children's centre. I met him. This is Paul and Arnold. This is Paul Niederman. His brother is the smaller man there called Arnold Niederman, and he, he has died. Mary Elms' colleagues took Paul out of the camp, and Mary Elms arranged for Arnold Niederman to be, um, take, to be included in a convoy of refugees going to the States. Um, Paul is now 90, he's living in Paris, and he uses every breath in his body to talk about what had happened, lest we forget. We might know nothing about Mary Elms if it wasn't for this man, Ronald Friend. Um, the story starts with him in about 2011. He retired in 2011, and he had always known that there was Quaker involvement in his escape from Result Camp. Um, his father died in uh, Poland, and he wondered, how did I live, how did I get out, and he started to do some research. In 2011, he got the name Mary Elms from a Jewish organization called the OSE. That's the Oeuvre de Secours Enfants. It's a, it's a French organization. And so he had a name, Mary Elms. So he wondered, that's only in 2011, he wondered who was this woman and how did she help him? He happened to make contact with a man called Bernard Wilson, who lives in Kent. And he's a Quaker who had done an, a lot of research about the Quaker work in um, southwest France. And it was thanks to him and Bernard Wilson, they started a process of research. And after about four years, they found evidence and the data to prove that Mary Elms had extricated them from the camp in September in 1942, saving their lives. 
Around that time, Ronald wrote, he, he wondered if she was still alive. Unfortunately, she died in 2002. So he wrote this in an email to um, her daughter. There can be no doubt that we are alive because of your mother's deed. So you can imagine what she felt when she got that. He asked their permission, can I nominate her to be a righteous among the nations? And that's where the story begins. And just before we go back in her life, I'm just going to explain this picture is from 1943. Mary was uh, nominated Righteous Among the Nations in 2013. There was a ceremony in France the following year, and here's Ronald on the tracks that they built into Rivesalt to take the people out, so to take them out as quickly as, as possible and without much fuss, out of France now, they were taken out of France. So he goes back to where he was hidden in among with, with children in 1942, and he's walking down the street revisiting where he was hidden in as a child when he was age two until he was six. And he couldn't remember where the school was and there happened to be a person coming against him on the street. So he asked him, do you know where the school is? And this man said, you wouldn't be Ronald's friend by any chance. <laughs> and the man said, uh, yes, I am actually. And he said, uh, I was in school with you in 1943. And the reason, he was always in his head, he wondered how these Jewish children who had been in school with him in 1943 had fared. And he knew this was a man who was obviously not French, so he said, I wonder was he one of those Jewish children. And thanks to that, he got a picture, and you see the arrow points to his older brother, and the older brother has the hand on, on Ronald. And the man who actually gave them that picture is just on the left there. So that's the beginning of the story, it starts with a wonderful coincidence. So, who was Mary Elms? She was born in Cork in 1908 into really quite a privileged household. That's her mother and her father is there and this is her with her brother. Um, she grew up in Black Rock. Uh, her father was a pharmacist and um, they ran a pharmacy in Winthrop Street in Cork. So they were really quite well off. Um, as well as that, the, mother, the mother's family um, came from a quite prosperous um, background as well. Um, what's interesting, I wanted to know what were her early influences? Why did she go on to do what she did? And very interestingly, in 1910, Emmeline Pankhurst came to Cork and she gave a speech in City Hall. And one of, actually, Eliz this is Elizabeth Elms, her mother. Her friend, Suzanne Day, wrote, she put a match to the unlit beacon of, of uh, suffragette opinion, and it exploded in Cork. And they, they, on, in the wake of that, they um, founded the Munster Women's Franchise League. And Mary Ann's mother was one of the founder members, and she was the treasurer. So she was campaigning for women's rights. She was campaigning for the vote for women. So she wanted her daughter. Obviously, education was quite a big thing for her. In 1915, Mary started school with her brother on the same day, funny thing, in Rochelle School. And you can see it's a rather grand school. And it's very interesting, actually, looking back at her school years. She was in school from 1915 to 1925, very, very turbulent years. She witnessed a world war. She witnessed all the phases of the Irish Revolution. And she witnessed, I suppose, the struggle for uh, women's rights. And each one of those things, I think, had a, an influence on her. It's also quite interesting that at the time, just as she started, a woman called Christine Bewley took over as the principal of the school. And she turned this into, she wanted to give women a thoroughly modern education and prepare them for life in, in home or in professional life. So she had really good opportunities um, when she was a young child. Two things, I think, happened that influenced her. In 1915, the Lusitania sank off the coast of Cork. Um, Cork went en masse to help the survivors. Mary Elms and her father was among them. He was a pharmacist, so he was trying to issue restoratives to the people there. She spoke about that all her life. She met the survivors, and I think that marked her. And um, they were also very aware of the war that was being raged in Europe, and she knit socks for the soldiers on the front line in, in World War I. And Field Marshal, Marshal French, who is actually quite a, a, a high-ranking general, wrote to her to thank her very much for the socks, you know, so she was aware of what was happening outside. Um, and then in Cork at the time, they tried to keep um, the War of Independence and the Civil War outside the gates, and there was a curtain of, 
censorship imposed on the school but it didn't work I suppose because many times bridges were blown up or the transport was off and the students couldn't come to school and in the burning of Cork in 1920 their family premises was burnt actually so that would have been very present to her she would have known what was going on around her so I think she, she got a very good education here. They even had French uh, conversation classes. They had a science laboratory. You know, if you look at the... So here she was. She had a really good education at second level. So then she came to Trinity. Okay, so this is... Uh, here she is in Trinity. Uh, she came to Trinity. She was here. She enrolled in 1928. She studied French and Spanish. And um, she was here for four years. And it's, it's very interesting. I suppose at that time, women had already been in Trinity for 25 years. But they were still seen as a kind of um, a danger to the men, to quote the uh, title of Susan Park's wonderful book, which talks about this period. Um, they had to wear their academicals. Um, there was a curfew. They had to be out by 6 o'clock. There were certain places they couldn't go, including the dining hall. Um, and actually, in 1931, when Mary was there, five women, not her, I was disappointed to find, stormed the dining hall um, to protest. Um, she had her head down, though, because she really was, she, she um, excelled from the beginning. Any Trinity students here? Yeah, just two little things I, I found very interesting. Samuel Beckett taught her. He would have taught her a course on Racine in, in 1931. And I think one of the influences here was the first professor of Spanish, a man called Walter Starkey, um, taught her as well. And I think he had a big influence on her. He had an influence on a lot of the students. He, was, uh, he wrote a book called Raggle Taggle, and he himself was a kind of a vagabond fiddle player who went around Spain and Romania with, with the gypsies or the Roma and he, I'm sure he told his students about that so she had a lifelong love of, um, of Trinity and after that there's a professor Rudmose Brown wrote a reference to her when she applied to go to the London School of Economics which was quite unusual in 1932 um, there still were a quarter of the students here were women it was, it's, and they actually did proportionately much better than, than the men. So even though the authorities were, wor were worried that they would, um, men would fall into bad marriages or that the women, that their, it would affect their grace and femininity, I quote, they actually did very well. So she was singled out as a woman of exceptional intelligence. She won the gold medal in 1932 and off she went to the London School of Economics and here she is with her fur, fur coat. She excelled there too, which I suppose isn't surprising. And she won a scholarship to go to Geneva. And I found it quite interesting. Her application for the scholarship was a day late. And she says, I'm very sorry to be a day late, but I hope you accept it anyway. And they did. So I suppose that kind of gives them a measure of the, the quality of the student. Um, she was in Geneva in 1936. In 1936, uh, it was very turbulent time. So you had Hitler organising his Olympics to show how great Germany was, papering over the tensions that were going on there. You had Mussolini invading Abyssinia. She would have been very aware of all this. She went back to London, and there's a little bit of uncertainty here, but even though she had a degree and a postgrad degree, she was working as a secretary. So I think all her life she would have loved to have been a diplomat. She studied international relations, but she was working as a secretary. And she met this man who you see on the right here. He has a cloak and he has a dicky bow. And that's, that's Sir George Young. He's a tremendous character. He was a diplomat who spent many years in Spain. Um, he was a journalist. He was a linguist. And he had quite the flourish about him. Um, he used to dip his sticky bow in coffee to dye it, you know, so he was quite a character. In night, but, and he was, loved Spain. In 1937, after the fall of Malaga, he decided to put together the British Ambulance Unit because he feared that the Republicans who were defeated in Malaga, they were going to... Um, there would be a mass exodus and they were going to be killed en masse. And he very quickly put out a call for nurses and doctors and humanitarian aid. And Mary Elms answered this call. It all happened very quickly. And um, she arrived in Gibraltar. She had a pass just for five days. Um, but she wasn't going anywhere. She wanted to stay put. 
and there she is. And actually, you see the letters, they'll say, what are we going to do with Mary Elms? She's not a doctor, she's not a nurse, but she could speak Spanish, and she was very intent on staying there. And quite soon, she was um, um, appointed to a feeding station, as you see here. Any students of Spanish Civil War here? No? You see very, very quickly um, how effective this humanitarian aid group was. They set up hospitals in the villas. Um, here she is into action. So they were, she arrived in Almeria and they took over three villas. This is the ambulance unit. And they set up very effective hospitals. Um, one of the things that would serve her very well in the Second World War was she was a very good, she saw how things worked. During the Spanish Civil War as well, it was the first war when civilians were targeted. So you began to see medicine began to change and you began to see um, how people responded to that so well. And she would have learned a lot there. She's there with her friend Dorothy Morris, who was on the front line in these hospitals. So in later years, um, Mary in Amaria began to be pounded from the air and attacked from the sea. So they had to move into Murcia, and from Murcia they went into Alicante. And at this stage, in Alicante, Mary was the director of a hospital. So she was a really good administrator. And when she arrived in the hospital, there were a lot of tensions because there was difference between how the Spanish doctors um, their view of medicine and the nurses. Hygiene was a big issue and the, the Spanish doctors apparently didn't have any regard for hygiene at all. And when she arrived actually in Murcia, the Spanish doctor was on the point of leaving. He said, I have enough of these British nurses. They give me tea and they say, thank you, thank you, thank you, but they don't listen to anything I say. So she came into that and she was able to actually negotiate a peace deal, if you like, and settle down. I'm just going to give you three little vignettes of her work in Spain. In her later years, Mary Elm spoke very little about the Second World War. She did, however, speak about the children of Spain. Um, they marked her very deeply. On the left is a little girl called Palmyra. She was 18 months when she was injured in the marketplace in Alicante in 1938 and she nearly lost her foot. And at the time, the doctors wanted to amputate it. And the doctors in Mary Elm's um, hospital said, no, let's try to save it. And they put her on a board for three months, and she was rehabilitated, and they saved her leg. So that was one little story. And there, there is Mary uh, running. This is in Pollock. It's a little place in the mountains in Spain. She ran that hospital. Um, the women that she worked with, the volunteers in the Spanish Civil War, and later the people she worked with um, in the Second World War, you see their incredible commitment to humanitarian work. And also, they were really gifted at carving out places, havens of peace and calm in the middle of war. Later, that would save many Jewish lives. Um, but it all started here in Spain. At this point, Sir George Young had run out of money and he appealed to the British Quakers and to the US Quakers. So that's when she started to work for the Quakers. Um, and they, the Quakers had an organization called the American Friends Service Committee. And I'm, I'm going to mention that later because they have a wonderful archive. So if anybody is interested in further work, I got a huge amount from their archive. So here she is with a little boy called John Lewis. And this little boy is Tato. She wanted to adopt him. He was found wandering on the battlefields. And actually, she couldn't adopt him because she was too, not because she was single, but because she was too young, apparently. Her son said she had to be 45. But I think I found as well the Spaniards were very reluctant to let their children go overseas. Here she is with a, a boy called Pepe. Um, in 1937, uh, Mary's father died unexpectedly and her mother wrote to her, this will give you an insight into the kind of determination of the woman, wrote to her and said please come home and she said I can't come home, I have to stay at my post, I won't come unless somebody replaces me and nobody replaced her um, so she stayed. And in some ways, that's very gallant. But you do see her mother at several stages going, where is my daughter? And she goes to friend's house asking the Quakers. She loses track of her several times throughout her career. You know, So that's the, the kind of hard side for the, um, the parent at home. This little boy, Pepe, um, Mary didn't 
None of her letters from the Spanish Civil War survive, but what survives is her album of photographs. And her colleagues actually fill out the details and they write about the people in the photographs. Pepe was 12 and he had some disease. They didn't know exactly what it was. In 1938, um, he made all the Christmas decorations for the party that year. And just in New Year, he made this. This is about two inches, this little card for Mary Ellen. So he said, uh, Miss Mary Ellen's Hospital in Glace, that was the hospital they were in in Alicante, Happy New Year, Pepe. So that's an entry in her diary. And then the next entry is January 11th, Pepe died. So this is the reality. So many children died um, during the war. Um, as you know, after the fall of Barcelona in 1939, this is to explain how she ended up in World War II. 500,000 Spaniards um, fled over the border. There's Le Pertus in, in France. When you see the waves and human tides of people coming, it's like turning on the it's like turning on the television, but it's in black and white. Then you turn it on now. At the moment, it's the Rohingyas, almost the same numbers and the same tide of people. Um, five hundred people uh, came over. Five hundred thousand people came over the border, and two of them, I spoke to their mother. This is Carmen and Mercedes Canadell. Um, they fled from Girona. As they were going, they remember being pounded by the airplanes. Their mother told them, bite the branches. Um, they have a memory of picking up things because people were so tired and hungry, they would drop their belongings. And they, the, one of the nice things, they remember picking up a makeup bag and uh, they were charmed by it. And then a couple of kilometers later, they jettisoned that too because it was just too heavy. And Mary Elms would go on to help these children. And um, they ended up in Reef Salt. When these people came over the border, they thought they were going to be greeted as brothers in arms or as friends. They were treated as uninvited guests by the French government. The French government, it's true to say, were also very overwhelmed. Um, they corralled them onto the beaches, put them behind barbed wires. They erected a kind of a, a network of camps tent camps we still see today, wretched conditions. These little girls ended up in one of them, and they would later meet Mary Elms, who would take them out and, and feed them and bring them into one of her children's homes. So it's now 1939, we're in France, and Mary Elms finally gets a chance to go home to her poor mother in Cork. No sooner does she get home, she goes, uh, I'm going back again, you know. So she had a great love and respect for the spirit and enthusiasm of the Spanish people, and she wanted to help them in the camps in 1939. She wanted to go back and set up libraries, set up canteens, set up workshops. And this man, I met him before Christmas, he's 82. Um, she was known as Miss Mary in the camps and he still remembers her as if it was yesterday. Here he is as a little boy. He fled um, over the border, ended up in a camp called Argelès sur Mer. I know you know this one. And the conditions there were terrible. Um, he remembers a child being bitten by a rat and his mother slept with him with a stick in bed to hit the bed to scare away the rats. Um, despite that, he said, the Spaniards, they sang, they danced, they set up school, they set up choirs, they wanted to learn more, they wanted, um, you know, they wanted books. Into this Mary came, and I'm going to read one little um, extract because this will give you an idea of the type of person she was, and it's also a lovely reference to Trinity. As well as this man, um, there was a Catalan poet in a, in a, a refugee camp called Agusti Bartra. And he suddenly realised that he was going to be stuck there for longer than he thought he would. So he, t he decided to put his time to good use and study English. He asked about the possibility of getting hold of a book or a dictionary, and somebody suggested writing to the Quaker office in Perpignan, 75 miles away. I did so, and some days later received a package, he explained a few years afterwards. It contained a Spanish-English dictionary used on whose first page was the signature and address of the person who sent it, Mary Elms, TCD Dublin. I will never forget it. Mary Elms did not send me a dictionary, 
She did infinitely more. She sent me her own. This dictionary, which has travelled with me during all my exile, is for me a luminous example of love. I wish she might know that the Catalan poet to whom she sent her dictionary still keeps it in his work. It's anybody I met who knew and remembered her, like this man, they couldn't say enough for her. She was like this light coming into the camp. Um, she would bring this woman was the head of the workshop, uh, the sewing workshop, and she knew Mary Elms very well. When this man grew up, all his life he heard about Miss Mary, Miss Mary, Miss Mary. She never once let us down. And he, he spoke about how his mother had tears in his eyes. I suppose one of the sad things, and this is kind of going to prefigure what's going to happen in World War II, is when 1949 came, both of them, Mary Ann's and this woman, both lived in Perpignan. They were very close, and they never thought to look each other up. It was like, you know, we got through that, we'll get on with it. And to this day, actually, Gilbert is, is really sorry that his mother never thought to contact her in all those years. So, that's just... Okay. So here we have the Spaniards, and now it's, it's 1939 and the Second World War comes out. So those same camps start to fill up with refugees coming from German Jews, starts to fill up with, uh, after the fall of France, um, which happened very quickly, there was another staggering number of people on the move. Eight million people came down from Belgium and the Netherlands uh, into the camps. As the months progressed, they, there were more and more Jewish people. Um, but still, they managed to produce these beautiful things. It, her, in her family collection, this is a beautiful um, deer cart from bone that her, her children still have. And this is a little anvil made in one of the workshops. So while all this was going around, again, it's the theme of these, these amazing women. They were mostly women at this stage working for the Quakers. Mary was the head of the Quaker delegation in Perpignan. She had a staff of about 30 people, huge budgets, and she was organising it all. And people gave her presents. So this was the type of things that um, was coming out. Okay. Uh, Riefsalt internment camp opened in 1941. At this stage, a lot of the tent villages had gone. Some of the Spanish refugees had gone home. And I suppose it's fitting that this is a very, very dark photograph because Riefsalt was a really dark place. It was built by the military, the French military, as an army base, but they decided if the conditions there were so bad, it was sweltering in winter, and it was, it was sweltering in summer, and it was freezing in winter, that in fact even the horses couldn't stay there. It wouldn't be suitable for the horses. So in 1941, they put the Spaniards in there, they put the Roma in there, they put the Jewish in there, they put Belgians, um, up to 18,000 people. At that stage, and this is where Mary really comes into her own, most of her work is to do with reef salt. So she's trying to feed these people, she's trying to educate them, she's trying to um, <coughs> occupy them in workshops and canteens. Um, in 1942, it's interesting, in 1941, somebody came and they said, uh, oh, it's anti-Semitic, the Jews are being treated badly. It's very interesting to see at what point did it change and when did the relief workers know what was happening. In 1941, Mary writes a very interesting letter and she said, I don't agree with these people who say it's anti-Semitic. They're coming, they're grandstanding and we don't want to upset the authorities. We have to work with the authorities. Um, I know that the Jews, they're tr free to travel within the camps. It is not the case. That would change very soon after. In 1942, in July, you have the biggest roundup of Jewish people in Paris. 13,000 people were rounded up and they were put in a sports complex known as the um, Velodrome d'Hiver. Um, 4,000 children were taken away and murdered. A lot of those uh, came down to the south of France and ended up here. It was at that point the relief workers were the first people to realise something's not right here. The authorities, including the French authorities, said, we're bringing all the families together again and we're, we're bringing them to Germany to work camps. And they said, no, that's not right. Um, in August, 
and actually they sent a delegation, Mary's colleagues sent a delegation to the Vichy government to say, actually they used the word annihilation, these people are going to be annihilated. It was denied. Um, you had Marshal Pétain, General Pétain, he was kind of old, he was just very worried about the French children, but you had uh, Prime Minister Laval who said, no, it's not true. But they knew that something was going on. So when in Riesselt in 1942, um, the authorities, actually the camp directors, some of whom worked with Mary, they called all the work, the work, um, they called all the aid workers, there were three aid workers working in the camp together, and they said the children are going to be deported um, with the adults. It was August 1942, and 2,289 adults left Riefsalt. They went to Drancy, outside Paris, and then they went to Auschwitz. 174 children left, and just 80 of them came home. If it wasn't for Mary Elms and her colleagues in the Red Cross and also the OSE, that number would be much greater. When they heard about it before the first deportation, there were nine, Mary Elms, she gathered children into her car and she took them into the mountains. And I mentioned before that she and her colleagues had created safe havens. Before deportations began, they had set up a number of what they called children's colonies. And what they were, they were like temporary respite centres or hostels for children in the camps. They would take the children out of the camps for a number of months because they were in such poor conditions, have a holiday, get their health back, you know, a little bit better and go back to the camps. So this was very important because she had a network of essentially safe houses. She'd set up herself about seven or eight of them. And the letters in the archive show what a wonderful administrator she was. She spotted um, places, there was one in verne le bain which Rudyard Kipling, it's a really uh, spa hotel, it would be a luxurious spa hotel today, but it was very damaged in 1940 in the floods, and she said this would be a good spot, and she negotiated the rental of it, and she set it up, and she equipped it with beds and people. So she had seven or eight of these places dotted around. So when 1942, August came, she had a network already in place. So this is another one of them, it's called La Villa Saint Christophe and the diaries of the woman who ran that are still extant and you have several entries saying Mary Ann's brought three Jewish children today, uh, couldn't quiet them down. There's one very poignant um, entry and it says what theatrics we had trying to uh, wash the little boys, they wouldn't take off their trousers. And the reason they wouldn't take off their trousers is their parents had warned them not to do so because then it would be clear they were circumcised and Jewish. Um, how many children did she save? There's a crucial period from August 1942 to October 1942. Um, 2,200 people, as I mentioned, were deported. Um, the estimate of her colleagues is that she and her colleagues saved 427 children. Um, I found documents that directly linked Mary Elms to at least 70 children. Those are documents I found for a very short period. It's very clear that she was working before that and afterwards to save children. So, um, here she is in her flat in Perpignan. Um, while all this was going on, actually, the first deportation went. She would have spirited away. Uh, it, it, there's a fa fascinating document that still exists to say she spirited away nine children from the first convoy. Um, that weekend, that week, 400 people were taken away. None of them came home. Um, that weekend, Mary and her friends went on a mountaineering trip. And there's a beautiful account of how they went hiking in the mountains. And I think this is how they kept sane. Um, a lot of their letters, you have this horrendous um, difficulty. They're trying to think on their feet. They're trying to exploit the bureaucracy. They're trying to work with the transfer lists. They're trying to get people off the convoys. But if they get somebody off the convoy, somebody else goes on. They're trying to do this. And the way they keep sane is they meet and they try to do normal things. And here she is, you can still see this balcony in Perpignan. And I love this picture because 
and this one too, it shows she was always well turned out. You know, this lady wasn't going to, she was very focused, very determined, and very well turned out. And that balcony appears several times in the papers because it was a sunny balcony and anybody who came through Perpignan would have dinner there. So um, all those people left uh, Rufsat and then in 1942 everything changes because the Germans invade, are, they occupy Vichy France. The camp is closed and the whole thing changes um, considerably. She gets, this is her apartment, she gets an inkling in January 1943 that something is wrong. And she clearly had a number of compromising documents and she hid them under her bath. And two days later, on the 5th of February, two uh, police, German police uh, policemen came and arrested her and took her to prison. Um, she was an Irish neutral. Um, she went to first to Toulouse prison, which was a, a, a kind of a local prison, but then she was transferred to Fresnes outside Paris, which was a serious prison. People didn't come out of Fresnes. She told her son how she heard shots of people who were executed. She was particularly afraid of being shipped out to somewhere in the east, and that happened to her colleague, her cellmate, who went to Ravensbrück and actually came back but was very marked and died shortly after the war. So she was there for six months. And while she was there, this is her mother comes back into play. There's a letter from her mother in March. Again, she's lost track of her daughter. Uh, she's writing to Philadelphia, where's my daughter? And you know that, she, that she's in prison, but her mother doesn't even know where she is, not, not alone, she's in prison. And what's happened is her, her uh, brother knows she's in prison, but they kept it from the mother because she had a heart condition. And I tell you, it was a mistake. Because when the mother found out, I'll tell you, it's like black cat, black kitten. Because you see the determination and the ingenuity of Mary Ames's mother in writing to everybody and using, she had several connections in the war board in, in uh, the States to get her daughter out of prison. And it's, it's phenomenal to see those letters. So between her and the Quakers, um, the Red Cross, and the Irish legation in Vichy, which were quite criticised for not doing enough, actually. Um, eventually, her mother decides to contact um, the German ambassador in Ireland. And I don't have a document to prove this, because there are several documents, but her son says that's how she got out. So she got out after six months. And she arrived back in the office. This one is, she's just arrived back. <coughs> And her colleague said she arrived back as well-groomed as ever. And when she was asked about it, she said, well, we all experienced inconveniences in those days, didn't we? You know? So we're nearly at the end. This is uh, a lovely portrait of her, uh, painted by one of the Spanish artists she worked with, Bal Bal Balbino Giner, excuse my uh, pronunciation. And this is her in later life. She went back to work as if nothing has happened and continued to work with the refugees. Um, she continued to work with French schools. She fed about 85,000 uh, French children in a, a, a feeding, uh, a canteen feeding scheme. Uh, 1946, she married a man called Roger Danjou, settled down and never spoke about it again. She occasionally spoke about the Spanish Civil War. She said very little about what she had done saving children. She did tell her children, uh, I hid a family in my flat in Perpignan, an Austrian family. Um, she would say occasional things. Um, she was offered the French uh, Foreign Legion, La Légion d'Honneur. She turned that down. She didn't want any um, fuss. Um, in about 1984, several years after the war, the French department, I'm not sure which French department, they sent her a compensation check for her six months in prison. It was for 24 francs, which is about five euros. Um, some people took a case. She, she let it go. Um, I spoke to um, cousins of hers who would visit in the summer. Let's see what we have next. Yeah, who'd visit in the summer, and she'd bring them to the beaches where she worked with the Spaniards. She would bring them past Reef South where she saved so many children, and she never said a word, never said a word. Um, her husband didn't want her to work. Uh, 1946, France was a very sexist place. Um, 
the head of government, uh, General de Gaulle, very well known, he said, to, I want the women of France to make 12 million bonnie babies for France in the next decade. So um, she seemed to have been happy enough to, to become a wife and mother. She had two children. Those are her children at the back. This is Patrick, who, who came to Ireland for the, for the launch of the book last month. And this is um, her daughter, Caroline. And these are her three grandchildren. And this is at the ceremony in 2014, where she was finally awarded and named as a righteous among the nations, you know. So um, finally, I said, why, why don't we know about this woman? Um, so after doing the book, I found out that all that about her. And I thought, this is certainly a woman that needs to be honored and remembered. But I think the story that struck me most and that shows that her legacy is alive every single day today is Charlotte's story. I showed Charlotte in... Uh, she was one of the women whose mother was uh, deported to Auschwitz in 1942. She had nothing of her mother's, not... Uh, she had one memory. She didn't have a picture, she didn't have a memento, nothing. I interviewed her in February and as I was finishing the research for the book, um, I was looking through the files one last time. I knew there was a file where there had been messages from people who were being deported. And I found this message from her mother, which she gave out the window of a train on her way to Drancy and finally Auschwitz. And it said, give her, my daughter Charlotte Berger, my most affectionate thoughts and a thousand kisses. And... She never got that letter. It was sent to a children's home. Charlotte was in that children's home, but wouldn't be there for many years. And she never saw the letter. So I gave her that letter. And for me, that was really the spirit of, of Mary Elms. Um, she's now 80, this lady. And after the book was done, I, I went to Paris to see her again, um, just as two human beings. And we met. and. She's an amazing woman. She said, I want to give this document to the uh, show and memorial in Paris. And when she was giving the document, they said, hold on a, a moment, we might have a picture of your mother. And they gave her a picture of her mother. And I met her about an hour after that. She's 80 years old. We sat down and we looked at a picture of her mother. This woman saw her mother's face for the first time, aged 80. And that's one little tiny thread of what Mary Elms did, how it resonates today. So that's all I have to say. <laughs>